space weather. It's defined as the variations in space environment between the Sun and Earth and how it impacts systems and technologies in orbit and on Earth. The Sun plays a huge role in influencing space weather. During a powerful solar storm, the Sun produces coronal mass ejections, or CMEs which are made up of magnetized solar particles called plasma. This is the same phenomena that creates the spectacular northern lights. And during these events, 100 million tons of plasma is ejected from the sun's surface, traveling over a million miles per hour. This creates geomagnetic storms here on Earth, but thanks to the Earth's magnetic field, we are protected. Space weather events like these could disrupt our power grids, impact GPS coordinates, and create other magnetic changes that impact different technology is strong enough. Solar flares are different from CMEs. Each travel at different speeds and have different impacts on Earth. CMEs look more like a large wave of gas versus flares looking like a bright light. Flares can produce strong X-rays and disrupt the area where high-frequency radio waves travel in the atmosphere and block them. This can lead to temporary blackouts in navigation and in communication events known as radio blackout storms. And just like meteorologists can use various weather models to help create a forecast, scientists at the Space Weather Prediction Center can use simulations to help predict these mass ejection arrivals, helping alert certain groups ahead of time that may be impacted by these events, such as power companies or airlines. With THB 11, I'm Corrales Ortiz. This is cloud iridescence. These type of clouds form from tiny ice crystals or water droplets, which can cause light to be bent. These features look like random cloud patches or bands, and when the light spreads, it causes an oil slick type of effect. You can best see them when the feature is positioned near the sun, with the sun hiding behind an object in the foreground, like a building or a tree. Iridescent clouds sometimes get confused with circumhorizon arcs, these type of arcs are features parallel to the horizon and are best visible in wispy cirrus clouds. One way to differentiate them is by their shape and position. Their colors are more organized in order like a rainbow and occur when the sun is high in the sky, about 58 degrees above the horizon. There's a feature similar to this called the circumzenithal arc, which looks like an upside down rainbow. This arc is centered on the zenith or the highest point in the sky and found at least 46 degrees above the sun when it sits low in the sky. Ever heard of sun dots? Well, according to the National Weather Service, these features look like a pair of colored patches within a halo when the sun is lower in the horizon. They are located roughly 22 degrees to the left and or right of the sun. Sun dogs are sometimes called mock suns and happen during very cold temperatures. Some of these features are more rare than others due to latitude and can be difficult to tell apart even for some experts, but they are nice to look at. With THB 11, I'm Corrales Ortiz. There's nothing quite like seeing the first snowflakes of the season. Those feathery ice crystals slowly falling from the clouds and blanketing the ground. Most of us learn at an early age that snowflakes form when water droplets merge with dust particles and freeze. When you think of snowflakes, you probably imagine them as your typical six-sided shape looking like branches. Well, here's your word of the day. That shape is known as dendrite, which means tree-like. But there are as many as 35 different snowflake shapes and combinations, such as plates, columns, needles, or prisms. A snowflake's shape can depend on a number of factors, such as temperature and humidity. For example, when temperatures are around the freezing mark or 32 degrees Fahrenheit and there's more moisture in the air, they'll form into more complex patterns like a six-sided shape or a hexagonal plate. At this temperature, they can become bigger in size as they fall since they'll stick to each other easier. That produces a heavy, wet snow. You know, that perfect kind for making snowballs. And as it gets colder though, snowflakes will tend to have simpler shapes, forming more of a prism or hollow column type shape. If the air is too cold though, the flakes won't stick to each other as easy, so they'll tend to be smaller. And that's when we see more of that dry, powdery snow that's much easier to shovel. Beyond that, the reason why it's pretty much impossible for the shape of any two snowflakes to be alike is because each one is made up of different molecules. 
Slight variations give them their unique qualities by the time they reach the ground because each snowflake is impacted differently as it falls through the atmosphere. Whatever shape or form the snow comes in though, it's still pretty to look at as it falls. And that's what the sign says when it comes to why no two snowflakes are alike. The height of a wasp, hornet, or bee nest has been used to determine whether it'll be a snowy winter. There's a weather lore rhyme that goes like this. See how high the hornet's nest will tell how high the snow will rest. It's been thought that they do it as a way to help protect the nest for an upcoming hard winter. During the arrival of winter, most of these nests are empty though. The colony dies out with only a few fertilized queens left hibernating so it likely doesn't matter how high the nests are off the ground. Crickets have also been used to predict temperature. It's been proven that when it's warmer out, crickets tend to chirp more. A formula is even used to convert cricket chirps into Fahrenheit. Just count the number of chirps within 14 to 15 seconds and add 40 to get to temperature. One of the oddest animal related methods out there used for weather prediction though, has to be pig spleen forecasting. Yeah. You heard that right. It's a method mostly known in a small community in Saskatchewan, Canada. Gus Wickstrom learned this method from his father, and it has been passed around the family. Every six months, a pig will be butchered, and the spleen will be examined and divided into six sections, representing the following six months. They look at the fat to determine things like temperature and precipitation, even specific dates and weather events. Did any of these surprise you? With THB 11, I'm Corrales Ortiz old saying that states if it rains on the first day of the month then it will rain 15 days in that month this saying stems from old weather lore and it doesn't have a traced origin but we can use it and see what the science says about this myth we need to compare and see how often we have 15 days or more of measured precipitation a month for example here in little rock we've had two months so far in 2021 where rainfall was measured on the first day none of which saw 15 days or more of measured rain in that month. Statistically, one might assume that if we see measured precipitation earlier in the month that the chance of seeing more recorded rainy days may be higher, but the amount of rainy days can vary based on location, climate, and even season. In wet regions like the Pacific Northwest, they can average 15 days or more of rain about five months out of the year. In January of 2020, Seattle had a record-breaking month with 30 days of measured rain. Now compare that to places in the southwest, which often just get a few inches a year. Back here in Arkansas, our average rainy days range between 6 and 11 days monthly, with spring being the wettest period. From January 2020 to May 2020, we averaged over 15 days of measured rain each month within this period none of which saw measured rain on the first day. So causation isn't always correlation in this case, meaning that the science says this weather lore doesn't hold up. With THV 11, I'm Corrales Ortiz. We are well into severe weather season here in the South. With that comes the risk for tornadoes. What's up? Going green. <laughs> Greenage. It's been long thought that when the sky turns green during stormy weather, that a tornado is likely to occur. But that's not always the case. Let's see what the science says causes the sky to turn green. Developing thunderstorm clouds tend to be tall. Normally, the storm clouds produce more of a bluish hue to them. The combination of the storm clouds thickness and the diameter of the water droplets in them can make the clouds look green if the setup is just right. Thunderstorms usually occur and are the strongest later in the day when the sun is setting. Most often during a sunset, we see yellow to reddish colors due to the particles scattering the rays when the sun sits low on the horizon. Sometimes the combination of those sunset colors and the blue hue from the storm clouds can cast a greenish hue at the base of the cloud. It's important to note that not every storm cloud turns green and not every storm cloud needs to be green to indicate a possible tornado. Often the rotating thunderstorms or supercells that are known for producing the tornadoes will likely just produce large hail and damaging winds. In short, a green sky doesn't always mean a tornado is possible, but you probably want to take cover and start heading inside soon. With THB 11 weather, I'm Corrales Ortiz.